الحمد لله الحمد لله ذي الفضل والفضل والإحسان الذي هدانا للإيمان وفضل ديننا على سائر الأديان ومن علينا بإرساله إلينا أكرم خلقه عليه أفضل الصلاة وسلم تسليما كثيرا حبيبه من خلقه وخليله وعبده ورسوله وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My respected elders, beloved brothers, and my honourable sisters, and our beloved children and kids that are here as well. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless each and every one of you for taking the time out to attend events like these, organised by very dedicated and honourable organisations like the organization our brother introduced and the speech that our brother Ibn Sam gave I think that speech is sufficient for us there is no need for me to speak I'm a skin like me but inshallah we'll mention a few points that can help us in all the different phases of our life whether we are married or not whether we are looking to have kids or whether we have kids or whether our kids have grown up already. Inshallah, there will be something of benefit ta'ala, by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal in the discourse that we will have today for each and every one of us. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from each and every one of you and from the organization Bidnillahi Ta'ala. Allah Rabbul Aizza Jalla Fi Ula from his sunnah, from his tradition, is that he has created everything in pairs. He has created everything in pairs. And he says, That we have created you in pairs. As in, everything has been created in pairs. Similarly, you and I, we are created in pairs as human beings. From this, Allah Azza wa Jal allows the tradition of life to continue. So this male and female can procreate and can allow this tradition of life to continue all the way until the day of Qiyamah. بِإِذْنِ تَعَالَى وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And this verse itself is a refutation of one of the leading ideologies in the world today. The brother mentioned the rainbow, but transgenderism and various other ideologies and isms and schisms that exist in the day and age that we live in, which are basically areas and challenges that we need to up our game we need to up our experience to be able to challenge them you see when the prophet وسلم, he drew a line a vertical line in sand 
a vertical straight line in sand or on the ground. And then he drew multiple horizontal lines on the left and on the right. He said that the straight line is the pathway of Haq, is this pathway of al Islam. And then he drew multiple lines on the left and on the right, saying that these are pathways that will seek to misguide you from this straight path. And at the head of each of these pathways, there is a shaitan, there is a master, there is a, there, there is a master that is curating this, these pathways and managing them and calling people to fall into these paths. So this tells us that there isn't one path, there is many paths. There is one straight path. There will be other paths where we'll, we will be tempted to fall into. So it's incumbent then when we say that Iman and Istiqama. When a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said to him, advise me, give me a nasiha, give me an advice, or tell me about Islam, tell me about Islam, something where I don't have to ask about Islam to anybody else. Here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advises this man that believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. Believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. Thumma istaqim. Then have istiqama. So Iman plus istiqama is a summary of what it is that you and I ought to do in our life here in this worldly life. Iman and istiqama. Iman having belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. But then having istiqama, steadfastness upon this pathway of Al-Islam. But how can you have steadfastness if you do not know the dangers out there? If you do not know the darknesses out there? If we leave our child in a dark room, how do we expect them to find light in this room? A small child, an infant, will start running around in this room. They won't think of this idea of putting on the light. As adults, as parents, we know that we have to put the light on. So we go ahead and press the switch, the button, and put the light on. But then when you put the light on, there could be other darknesses, other issues, other problems, other dangers that are awaiting on the ground. For example, in your garage, there could be something sharp like a screw, or a piece of glass, or anything of something of danger that this kid could step on, and that could cause him a danger. They don't know about the consequences of these dangers. But you and I are required that we go out of our way to understand these dangers, to understand these problems and these darknesses aside from the light that exists, the light of Iman. Istiqama gives us the sufficient effort and knowledge that we need to put into play to be able to understand the other darknesses that exist. So that we can then circumambulate and move around and navigate correctly from all these other paths that seek to deviate us from the straight path. So, in terms of the Sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jalla, that He has created us in pairs, just like that, our mother and father, through their bond, you and I exist. Through their bond, you and I exist. And so the question arises, is our existence, is that the beginning, uh, beginning of that, is that it? Or does it require assistance? Do we require assistance and help and nurturing? Like just being in existence, is that in and of itself? Are we independent or do we still need help? and assistance, and nurturing, and food, and drink, and help in the various aspects of life. We're in need of that help. That help, my dear brothers and sisters, sometimes we think that we come into existence once we are walking around on the earth. And it is at this junction that we need the help of our parents. But rather, let us go a step before that. Let us go to a time when we were in the womb of our mothers. In that dark realm, in that darkness, who took care of us in that darkness? Who was there taking care of our affairs? Who was there taking care of our physical needs, of our mental needs? When we were a blood clot 
And then that formed into a bigger creature until it became a fetus. And then we had little hands and little legs and little feet inside of the womb. Who took care of us? It was Allah Rabbul Aziz Jalla Fi Ula who took care of every affair of ours. And Allah Azza wa promises that He will take care of every affair of ours until the day of Qiyamah. As in every single thing in our life has been written for us from our wealth, from the rizq, which includes wealth and health and various other things. No amount of human beings, no amount of jinn kind can come together to take away even a sip of water from you. So everything has been proportioned for you. What does this tell us? This tells us that our purpose in life is ought to be something greater than seeking and unlocking what Allah Azza wa has written for us. That there is something greater than that that we need to seek, that we need to search for, that we need to find. And so therefore, this adequately refutes a lot of ideologies like materialism and capitalism and even secularism and liberalism where the whole purpose is to gain something for yourself is to gain something for yourself is to increase yourself here we're saying that everything that can be gained has been written and proportioned by Allah no one can take that from me it is written by Allah and so therefore what is our purpose then our purpose my dear brothers and sisters as Allah tells us that we have not created the jinn kind and the mankind except for the worship of Allah Rabbul Jalla Worship is often misunderstood in the sense that it is only to pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla or to fast or to do the other acts and rituals of worship. But rather worship, my dear brothers and sisters, can be every aspect of your life. Worship is about your direction towards Allah Azza wa Jalla, your sincerity, your ikhlas towards Allah Rabbul Jalla fi ula. The dua that you make to Allah Azza wa Jalla, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us, Dua, who will ibad? Dua is worship. Right now, what we're seeing around ourselves in the world today, the calamities, the problems, the oppression, and the genocide that our brothers and sisters are facing, especially in Gaza and Palestine. What is the best thing that you and I can do? The best thing that we can do in a almost unlimited capacity. What is it? It is dua. Dua for our brothers and sisters there. Right? We might we may be incapable of anything else. But we have this ability to make dua to them, for them, dua for them, to Allah Azza wa Jalla, in the depths of our nights, in the depths of our worship, in the depths of our lives, we can make dua for our brothers and sisters who are going through all sorts of troubles and problems and oppression and genocide across the world. And so, worship, my dear brothers and sisters, is a concept in and of itself where we need to spend more time, some other time, to talk about the depth of it. This is our purpose. There is so much more to it. And one of the great scholars, Raghab al-Isfahani, he summarizes the purpose of a Muslim, of a mu'min, very nicely. He gives us three different stages. He says that first, it is al-Imara, it is to build your life. And the second is al-Ibadah, is to worship Allah Rabbul Aziz Jalla And the third is al-Khilafah, it is to become a servant to the creation of Allah to become a manifestation of what it is that pleases Allah on the face of this earth as in becoming in servitude to the creation to guide them towards Allah and this is further summarized in Surah Al-Asr indeed for a fact surely mankind is in loss except for those who believe and they do good deeds. See, these two categories talk about specifically what we do individually. Then they go out from outside of their own realms. They go to the next level and so on and so forth until this radius covers the whole world. They go out of their own way to advise each other to the haq, to the truth. The haq, where is this haq? This haq, this truth, is a system 
that the Muslim has on the face of this earth. You will not find, you can research as much as you can. And you can go and sit with every culture, every religious group, every people. You will not find such a system more pristine, more effective, more systematic, more surviving in the various time periods of this dunyawi realm than Al-Islam. Our tradition is rich, my dear brothers and sisters. We cannot even do it haq when we talk about it. That's how rich it is. And then it is divine, as in it has been preserved through the words of the Prophet wasallam. To this day, we have asnad all the way connecting us to the Prophet wasallam. And the same in terms of the verbatim word of Allah The word that Allah Azzawajal spoke. All the way into Jibreel السلام, who took it from Allah Azzawajal. As in this word is not a created thing. This word is the word of Allah Rabbul It is a sifa, an attribution, a characteristic of Allah Rabbul So then therefore, my dear brother and sister, when we have such a rich tradition, when we have such a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, such a sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that has been preserved in such a manner that you cannot find this method of preservation anywhere prior to us and after us. Every other method has taken from our method of preservation of the hadith of the Prophet And the same in terms of the Quran. The Quran has been preserved, this book, this Quran has been preserved in all of its beauty. And it cannot be fully explained in any other language except for the language of the Quran. The language of the Quran. See, the Arabic of the Quran is unique. It's classical. It has not been toyed with. There are other Arab dialects and things like this. But the classical Arabic of the Quran is a language that Allah Azza wa Jal preserves over time. And so this is the language of the Muslims. It's not a language belonging to a certain group or certain people, or certain race, because it is a language of the universality of an Islam. And through attaining this language, through attaining learning the Quran, and through attaining learning of the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, there is a great amount of benefit that each and every one of us can attain. ta'ala. So that, my dear brothers and sisters, sets a stage for each and every one of us in this pursuit of living a life of purpose. And one of the greatest purposes that you can have is to raise righteous children. That is the greatest purpose. There's a misconception that, or, or there is this downplaying of this idea of parenthood, of raising children. In the current modern context that we exist, it is seen as a hurdle, it is seen as a problem, it is seen as work, as effort, as a hardship. But rather, to raise righteous children and to give them a tarbiyah, a, a raising that is pleasing to Allah Azza wa is one of the greatest visions that you can have on the face of this earth today. Is one of the greatest visions. And who can take on some of these visions in the best capacity? Sometimes it's not the men. Sometimes it's not the men. It's the women. It's our sisters. This is one of the biggest and the most rewarding missions and the most rewarding vision that you can wish to apply in your life and achieve, you will get a great reward, a great amount of reward from Allah So this misconception that is something difficult, it's something hard, it's something bad, it's something that is going to waste your time, this misconception you need to get rid of. It is something that will elevate you. There is nothing in the Sharia of Allah Azza wa Jal in this Islam, in this pathway, in the Quran, in the Sunnah. That is nothing but an inspiration for you. Nothing but a benefit for you. Nothing but an elevation for you. It is all to increase you in goodness. It is all to increase you in reward and status and in honor. And so when we are in the womb of our mothers, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah Azza wa Jal provides for each and every one of us. And then when we are finally ready, we are released into, this, into the real world. And when we, we are released into the real world, it is at this junction that some of that responsibility falls on the shoulders of the parents. Some of that responsibility of taking care of these children, of changing their nappies, 
and whatnot, and all these uh, mundane tasks. But there are rather great tasks of raising these children to be of benefit to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From meeting their physical needs, their medical needs, their spiritual needs, their mental needs, until they're fully capable to do so by themselves. This responsibility can sometimes be referred to as parenting. But I don't like this word parenting. The word parenting is defined in the Ox Oxford Dictionary as the activity of raising children as a parent. Parenting, according to our definition, is much greater than that. It is to give all the hukuk of this child to this child. It's an actual responsibility that you need to fulfill. It is more than just an activity of raising children. It is more than that. There is a lot more to it. It is to produce someone for the ummah who is, benefit, who is of benefit to the world. Now, if we momentarily zoom out from the child and put our focus on the parents for a minute, we have to ask, are the ability, the skill, the knowledge, and the process to parent, is it the same as the responsibility of parenthood? You see, we have the, the capability of parenting, and then you have the responsibility of parenting. Are these two the same? Are these two the same? You see, there is a big difference. The responsibility of parenting is a time-based event. When you have a child, you are responsible to be a parent now. You, are, you have the responsibility of parenting. But the capability, the ability, the process, the method, the knowledge, the skill, the effort involved of parenting, is this something that is a time-based event? This is rather something that is an effort-based event, my dear brothers and sisters. It is something that has to occur prior to you attaining the responsibility of parenting. You see, this is another misconception that exists amongst many of our families in our communities, is that they begin to adopt the capability of parenting at the same time when they receive the responsibility of parenting. And this is wrong. Because what happens is, is that you are then rushing. You're in haste, trying to do as best as you can. But you cannot. It is too late. You haven't put in the effort. You haven't put in the time. And we'll talk about it in like that. Of what is required to attain the capability of parenting. The responsibility of parenting is easy. You just have a child. You are now responsible to be a parent. You have the responsibility. But to have the capability, to have a methodology, to have the process of parenting, that requires a lot of effort. It's based on effort. It's based on time. It's based on hard work that you put in. It's based on consequences that you will face because of the, the options and the selections that you will make in order to attain the capability of parenting. So that when your time of the responsibility of parenting comes, you have a skill, you have a capability to apply, you have a method, you have a process, you have done the groundwork that is necessary in order to have a successful methodology of parenting, in order to succeed in your responsibility of parenthood. So, my dear brothers and sisters, it is important that we understand which one comes first. Which one comes first? Don't make the responsibility of parenting come first. Make the capability come first. Learn about the capability. Understand it. T learn, teach it to your kids so that they are ready for it. And if you have already, you already have kids, but you're not sure what to apply, it's okay. You see, Allah Azza wa has created us, our brains, in such a way that you can always rewire, remap, the neural pathways of your brain. Don't ever listen to the advice that people give. That, you know, once you reach a certain age, you can never change yourself. Behavior is locked in, and this is locked in, and that locked in. No, you can always change. Allah Azza wa promises change. That if you seek Him in, in forgiveness, and you return to Him in Tawbah, He will change your situation. 
you change yourself, Allah Azza wa Jal will change you. If you are sincere in Islah, in bringing about goodness, Allah Azza wa Jal will apply it for you. You just have to turn to Allah Rabbul Izzah Jalla fi Ula and apply the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions and the righteous predecessors and the scholars after him all the way into our time period. And so what happens is, when people are faced with this responsibility, my dear brothers and sisters, they begin to scramble and they begin to do whatever it is that they can put their hands on in, in the bid to raise their kids. But this often leads to non-optimal solutions. It often leads to products and results that are not satisfactory. And so it's important that we take a step back and begin to understand what it is that is required from us in building this capability of parenting. And this capability, prior to experiencing the responsibility, how can it be attained? It can be attained through knowledge of it, foresight, having the correct vision, and taking steps at that early stage to make the process of parenting effective when the time is right. The capability of good parenting is something you need to put time and effort into, my dear brothers and sisters. It is something you need to make hard decisions which have real consequences. Like choosing where to live, choosing what career to pursue, choosing who to marry, all of these decisions lead to consequences in laws, environment, places that you live in, the time that you are then capable of giving to your parents. How many of us are so busy because of the career choices that we've made? We are so busy that our children are effectively orphans. Our children are effectively orphans. We get to spend an hour maybe a day and on the weekend a couple of hours but our minds are somewhere else because of the lives that we lead so our children are effectively orphaned it's like as if they're in a foster care family and you are the foster parent although you are the biological parent so my dear brothers and sisters this issue of parenting is a real issue we need to think about it from sometimes non-conventional lenses Sometimes in the solution may be that we zoom out completely and that we begin to rearrange our whole life so that we can then pursue this methodology of parenting in a way that will be effective in the lane's eye. Because life, in the way that it has been put for us, it is very individualistic. It is very uh, constrained in many ways. And so we may or may not be able to apply all the principles of the Qur'an and the Sunnah when raising our children. This effort, my dear brothers and sisters, this capability of parenting, is a multi-pronged effort. It's a multi-pronged effort. As in, it has multiple different aspects to it. And for simplicity, we can summarize it into four main phases. Four main phases. The first phase, my dear brothers and sisters, is while you are single, while you are an individual. We're talking about parenting while you're an individual. We're talking about parenting while you are single. How does that work? The way it works, my dear brothers and sisters, is that, that whatever you do, that is what will happen to you. And we have a qaida, a principle, that al-jaza'u bi jinsin amal that the, the, the response or the reward or the result of a action is similar to it. So if you do good, you have a good outcome. If you do bad, you have a bad outcome. So you have to look within yourself first. You come first. Do you, does your wife, you meeting your wife, expecting a child, having a child, living with that child, does that come first or do you come first? It's you, individually, who comes first prior to meeting your wife, meeting that partner, having that child, and then living with him. So then you have to introspect within yourself. You have to become that result that you are trying to build. You have to become that child that you're trying to raise. You have to become that optimal outcome that you want in your, ch in your children. You see, you want to raise your child to become a certain person 
to become a certain personality, to become a certain personality with a certain character, with a certain amount of knowledge, with a certain capability. You have to become that yourself. You have to treat your parents the way you want your children to treat you in the future. So when you become the essence of what it is that you're working towards, Allah Azza wa Jal will begin to give you that. And in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. That all you who believe, save yourselves and your people, your families, your offspring from the fire, whose fuel is stones and human beings. So, Allah Azza wa mentions, Who save your, protect yourselves, anfusakum, yourselves. He, he mentions yourselves first. He doesn't say ahlikum. He mentions yourselves. And earlier we mentioned the ayah from Surah Al-Asr. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ See these first two categories, they talk about you, your individual capacity. Then after you have addressed these two, آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Believe and done good actions, Iman and Istiqamah, then وَتَوَاصَوْ بالحق. Then go out and call to others. Advise each other in Haqq, in the truth. And advise each other to patience. See those latter two categories, it's talking about our communal responsibilities, of our responsibilities of going out. What do they say in the airplane? In the airplane, in the case of an emergency, that take care of yourself first. Put on the oxygen mask on yourself first. Then try to help others. If you cannot help yourself, you won't be able to help others. So you have to help yourself. And so this principle, my dear brothers and sisters, of looking at yourself first, building yourself to what it is that you are trying to work towards in the future. Whilst you're single, whilst you're young, whilst you're capable, and it doesn't matter what, at, at what age, so long as you are single, so long as you're an individual, you can apply this principle to yourself right now. And I will assure you, if we have husnul dhan billahi ta'ala, having good thoughts of Allah Rabbul Aizakil Rabi'ula, and he says himself, my slave who has good thoughts about me, I will have good thoughts about him. As in Allah Azza wa will pave the way for us if we simply turn towards Him. So it's, it's about becoming the ideal child you wish to have. Living a life upon the teachings of Al-Islam. This is very important. We have to live our lives upon the teachings of Al-Islam. We cannot expect great outcomes if we ourselves are not living a life upon the teachings of Al-Islam. Many times people want shortcuts. What should I do? Madrasa. Put my kids in madrasa. Put my kids in Islamic school. Put my kids in this online program. Put my kids in this program, and that program, and this program. All of these programs, my dear brothers and sisters, they can all help you to a certain capacity. But none of them can help them, your kids, to the capacity that you can help them. When you are an example to them, when you are an example to them, you are a living manifestation of the Quran and the Sunnah in front of them. They are seeing this day in and day out. Nothing can help them to that capacity. And all these places, you have to think about them, my dear brothers and sisters, they're all businesses. They're all businesses. Their vision is not one at the end of the day to raise your children. Their vision is not one to raise your children. Their vision is the bottom line. The bottom line in business means what was profitable, what was not profitable. What was the cost and what was the profit margin? This is their bottom line. So you have to take this affair within your own hands. You have to. I'm not saying avoid these places. No, utilize them. But you need to have an active and a proactive approach to raising your kids. And that starts with you becoming a full example, a full manifestation of the Quran in the Sunnah as best as you can. When you try, when you walk towards Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal runs to you. Every step that you take towards Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will come towards you. You see, with Allah Azza wa Jal, it's about effort. It's about effort. It's about taking the asbab, taking the causes. When you take a cause, the effect comes. You see, Allah Azza wa Jal has written everything for us. And perhaps He has written greatness for us. But this greatness, sometimes, 
there is, there's two ways to unlock it. One way is to unlock it by simply taking the asbab, Allah Azza wa opens it for us. The other one is that it is written for us, it will come down to us regardless of what we do. But the ones where we have to take the asbab, the asbab could be making dua to Allah Azza wa the asbab could be taking the right steps, as in, you know, getting a job, starting a business, etc. All these things, raising your, attempting to raise your children, teaching them yourself, or finding places for them where they can learn the Quran and the Sunnah, as well as other sciences. All of these are asbab. And through this asbab, perhaps Allah Azza wa will open up what He has written for you. This is the Sunnah of Allah Azza wa that you have to do something. Even when Musa alayhi salam was there in front of the sea and Fir'aun and his cronies, his armies were all behind him and Musa alayhi salam had not, nothing else to do it is at that junction Allah azza wa did not open the sea for him without an action from him he had to use his staff he had to strike the sea that was the asbab that was a course that he had to take for the sea to open up so he had to do something, even if it's small, even if it's tiny. So that's why don't belittle the two rakat qiyam that you do at night and the dua that you make to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Never belittle these actions. Never belittle a good word in nasiha that you may give to someone. Never belittle a, a dollar that you give in sadaqah. Perhaps through it, Allah Azza wa Jalla gives you something that he has written for you. Or he removes from you a calamity, a problem, a tribulation a disease, an affliction that you or your kids or your wives or your family will face through your good deeds Allah Azza wa removes that calamity from their life removes that affliction removes that difficulty to study and learn and to achieve something great maybe Allah Azza wa through your good actions removes that so that they are then able to achieve that greatness and with dua my dear brothers and sisters there are many examples from the Quran and the Sunnah where we get great examples like for example Rabbi Habli min al-Salihin Ya Allah Azza wa Jal Rabbi my Lord Habli min al-Salihin that give me or bless me with righteous offspring and other duas like Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yunin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama that our Lord Bless us with wives and offspring that are the coolness of our eyes. See this word, cool, coolness of our eyes, it's a very important word. In the Arabic language, it holds great significance. When you look at someone, you feel this calmness, you feel this peace, this serenity, this love, this absolute serenity towards them. This kind of feeling you want when you look at your wife, when you look at your children, you want to be that kind of happy. And this happiness, you will never attain this happiness, my dear brothers and sisters. If it's these children are indulged in the secular aspects of life without deen. If they do not have an Islam in their lives, you will not have that coolness in your eyes. I know so many people who send me messages, who talk to me and tell me that, look, my children are all doctors, engineers, businessmen. But I, I don't feel anything towards them. Why, why is this? They're highly successful in the worldly characteristics, in the worldly measurements. They're highly successful. Then I told them, did they pray? How is their Islam? They say that their Islam is a bit fuzzy. Their prayers are not on time. Have they paid zakat? All these things are question marks. This is why you don't find happiness. Happiness, my dear brothers and sisters, is when we connect to Allah. It is then and only then we find happiness. So in this dua, Allah Azza wa Jal teaches us through the tongue of the various prophets that made this dua. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا ذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُنٍ That bless us with wives and children who will be the coolness of our eyes. وَجَعَلْنَا and make us لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama And make us role models, good examples for those who have taqwa. See this word Imam, it doesn't mean that you become the person who prays and leads people in prayer. No, it's about becoming a Qudwa, an example to those who believe. 
a good role model. This is why when the Prophet sallallahu says, min ummati, they increase, as in have more children, so that the numbers of my ummah can increase. This akthiru here is a command. It's not referring to just have children. It is saying that have children and then raise them well. Have children who are responsible beings on the face of this earth and raise them well. So that raise them well part, a lot of times we forget this. Raise them well part has a lot of effort that we need to put into place when we have these children, bidhanillahi ta'ala. And in terms of choosing the right spouse, it is very important whilst you're an individual. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us the, that a dunya mata'un, that this dunya, this world, is a, an enjoyment. And the best of its enjoyment is a righteous woman. The best of its enjoyment is a righteous woman. You see, Allah Azza wa Jal, through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is teaching us in hyperlative terms, as in the best, this dunya, all of it is an enjoyment. The best of its enjoyment is a righteous woman. So the best thing that you can attain, and I tell this to the young brothers and sisters here, and I tell this to those who are single and those who are individual, and it doesn't matter whether you're married as well, that you make dua to Allah, Wallahi, Allah can change your situation. It doesn't matter what your situation is. Make dua to Allah, be consistent upon it, and He will change your whole situation to be in the right situation. Sometimes you, your situation is worsened and made difficult because of your own actions. Once you turn to Allah Azza wa you begin to purify and correct your actions. And so your situation begins to change. And you never thought that such a change could possibly exist. But it does. With Allah Azza wa nothing is impossible. Raise your hand to Allah Azza wa and make dua to Him. And you will change your situation. And so the advice I have for the individuals and our single brothers and sisters here, and even those who are not, is that you need to spend a lot of time asking Allah Azza wa for this khayr. For this hyperlative, for this best of enjoyment in this dunya is a righteous woman, righteous woman. That you make dua to Allah Azza wa that He blesses you with this righteous woman. That He blesses you with this righteous woman. If you make this dua to Allah Azza wa whatever plan that Allah Azza wa has, He will change that person so that they are righteous for you. You make this dua to Allah Azza wa and. In the day and age that we live in, it's so hard uh, in terms of marriage. There's a lot of brothers, I get a lot of complaints and, and a lot of requests of how do we do this, how do we make this work, how do we search for a righteous spouse, etc. It's a lot, it's, a, it's difficult. We live in a different context. Situation has changed. It's not, no longer like our back, back home countries where, they were, where these systems were in place for many centuries and millennia. Here it's a completely different ballgame. And so, the best solution in this regard, my dear brothers and sisters, to attain this righteous spouse, this righteous spouse, partner in your life, is to make dua to Allah Azza wa Jalla. For years prior to your marriage, as a single individual, on the, day, on the days and nights of Ramadan, in the last 10 nights especially, raise your hands to Allah Azza wa Jalla and make dua to Allah Azza wa Jalla before you even get married. This is the foresight I'm talking about. This is the capability of parenting that you need to be thinking about before you get to the responsibility of parenting. It is about raising your hands and asking Allah Azza wa Jal in this regard so that He can bless you with a righteous wife. And so we move on to the next stage, the second one, which is while you are married. So now from as an individual, as a single individual, we talked about certain principles and certain things and actions that you can take we move on to the second stage, which is while you're married. Now that you're married, you two have to get together and start to think about what it is that you're trying to achieve in life. Life is not about desire and fulfillment of this desire and living together and a holiday every now and then. Life is greater than that. Life is, having, is about having a vision, a vision that lies in paradise. 
A vision that lies in paradise. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says that a vision has to be something that lies, al himma has to be something that lies in paradise. And then you work towards it during your life. You take the means, the steps, in order to attain that. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't be something that's in the dunya. It should be something that is in the ukhrawi realm, in the akhirah, in jannah, in paradise. So that vision should be that you, you and your spouse, and your children, and their progeny, until the day of Qiyamah, your bloodline, all of them are in Jannah. That you have palaces, that you have land, that you have all sorts of rewards in Jannah, where you all get together and have parties and have various things in Jannah. You get to celebrate these things. That's a, an example of a vision that you could have. So it's about having a correct vision. Are you having children just for the sake of it? Because it's culture? Because many a times you find a lot of people they just have children because it's a cultural thing. It's a certain time period, we gotta get married. And then you have children as a result. So it's all become a ritual. It's just become a day-to-day -day thing. There has to be some cognitive goals and settings to it, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to start planning and plotting in regards to our marriages. It's very important. And it's about what world view do you have? The world view is very important, my dear brothers and sisters. Because the world view will shape how we raise our children. Will shape how we live our life. And this is something that has been taught to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the hadith that I mentioned about istikhama, about the different pathways. It's, it's about understanding the world view that you have about al-Islam. It's about how things work in life. Where is Allah Azza wa Jalla? Who is Allah Rabbul Azza Jalla Fi'ula? How do we connect to Allah Azza wa Jalla? What is the Quran? How do we understand it? And all these things. Once you understand all of these questions, this will shape, begin to shape your world. And you can only work on these things, my dear brothers and sisters, when you have a righteous partner with you and who is there supporting you so that when you go to your work, you come back home, you know that your partner has been preserving your secrets, has been preserving your methodology of raising your children, and has been doing all sorts of things that are in line with the Quran and the Sunnah, in commanding and forbidding evil within the house where your children reside and live. And my dear brothers and sisters, that then, with those two things, allows us to proceed to the third stage, which is now we are having children, now you're expecting children. So here you have to do various deeds. You have to do lots of good deeds. You have to allow the traces and the effects of these good deeds to fall on this body of yours, where this, in this womb there is a child. You have to do all of these good deeds, like reading the Quran, like giving sadaqah, like less quarreling and less argument in front of this child, even though this child is within the womb. It cannot hear it as well. But it can all it can feel the traces and the effects. And Allah Azza wa Jal is all watching and is all aware. He sees through your actions, He sees through your deeds, He will reward you in like manner. And so the effects of these good deeds will impact the the child before their birth. And in in a hadith of the Prophet, and I will have to try to rush a little bit because of the limitation of time. The Prophet says that Allah sends an angel who is ordered to write four things at the time of you know, this child when he is in the womb of the mother. He is ordered to write down this new baby or this new you know, child inside of your womb. Allah orders this angel to write down four things. His deeds, his livelihood, and his date of death and whether he will be blessed or wretched in religion. Then the soul is breathed into him. So a man amongst you may do good deeds till there is only a cubit between him and paradise. And then what has been written for him besides his behavior. And he starts doing evil deeds. Characteristics of the people of the hellfire. And similarly, a man amongst you may do evil deeds till there is only a cubit between him and the hellfire. And then what has been written for him besides his behavior. And he starts doing deeds characteristic of the people of paradise. You see, there are four things that are written, my dear brothers and sisters, 
is his deeds, his livelihood, his date of death, and whether he will be blessed or wretched. See, these four things, it is not that Allah Azza wa Jal is removing your free will, the free will of this child. No, Allah Azza wa Jal has full knowledge of what it is that this child is going to do in their life through their own free will, through the decisions that they're going to make. And then because of that, some of these decisions are made. So it's not that Allah Azza wa Jal is taking the free will of this child. So don't misunderstand this hadith like that. But the reason why I wanted to mention it is because of this point about his livelihood. You see, a lot of times when it comes to children and raising our children, we think too much about the livelihood that is the wealth aspect. And so because of this, we go into the spiral of becoming so busy and so removed from our children's lives in search of wealth, in search of a dream house, in search of this and in search of that so that we can give it to our children. But in that process, we lose our children. And in this, there's a da'af, there's a weakness inside of us. That weakness is that we are not fully aware that everything is in the hand of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Especially when it comes to their risk. Especially when it comes to their livelihoods. So if we can develop that tawakkul, that trust, deep down inside, and that iman, that everything belongs to Allah Azza wa Jalla and is within His hands, and He has the full capability, and He has written it, nobody can take it away from us. Then we begin to focus more on the child as opposed to searching for these things in order to, to build a better life. And there's nothing wrong with searching for it, but not at the expense of raising them. Not at the expense of raising them. So we need to have a balanced approach being in Allah Ta'ala. And then finally, my dear brothers and sisters, our fourth stage. This is while living with the child. See, the parents have a crucial influence in shaping the beliefs of a child. And in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us, that it is the religion of the parents that begin to shape the beliefs of the child in that environment. So if their parents were Jews, the child becomes a Jew. If their parents are Christian, the child becomes a Christian. And so if the parent is a Muslim who doesn't know his belief, who's never lived in Islam, then expect to, for the children to have that same religion. Is that the religion that, that, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us? The religion the Prophet ﷺ taught us is one where we need to implement it in our lives. It needs to be both al-iman wal amal. It needs to be a com combination of belief and action. When we do this, my dear brothers and sisters, we can then inspire our children to follow that same pathway, that same al-Islam. So from this we learn, my dear brothers and sisters, is that your children will take the religion of the parents. Your children will take the religion of you. And so it is incumbent upon you to have this religion of Islam in all of its manifestations. Not in what your environment has taught you, not in what your parents have taught you, but rather in the, in, in, in the methodology of the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba and the righteous predecessors. That methodology can only be attained and lived in our life if we implement it. So it's incumbent again, it comes back to us. We need to live a life and become the examples for our children to see and, and copy. You see, the children, they see and hear everything. The bad that they do is from the bad that you have. Remember this, the bad that they do is from the bad that you have. And it could also be from the environments that they live in, in the schools that they go to, and the other various places that they go to. So it's not always just from you. But it's, it's, a, it's a symptom that tells you that it is from a context that is influencing them and driving them. So you can then prepare the context. You can fix yourself, but you can also prepare and massage the context so that it is in a way that is ad advantageous to the child. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he advises Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and I'll skip the Arabic. One day I was riding behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, when he said, Oh dear little one, I will instruct you in some matters. Be watchful of Allah, the commandments of Allah, as in, in private or in public. Be watchful of the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal. He will preserve you. As in, if you protect Allah, Allah will protect you. You preserve 
the teachings and the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal, then Allah Azza wa Jal will preserve you. You see, the Prophet through this hadith where he's teaching Abdullah ibn Abbas, a young Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is teaching us how to teach our children. Is giving us core principles of what it is that we need to focus on. Is it calculus? Is it organic chemistry? Is it mathematics? Is it these things? Or is it some, some core principles that if we constantly teach our children, they will succeed in every other realm. Wallahi al-Azim, they will succeed in every other realm. Trust me, you will have doctors, you will have engineers, you will have everything that you wish, that you want. But you need to do the Islamic aspect first. If you do the Islamic aspect really well, trust me, you will attain success in the dunyawi aspects. The dunyawi aspects have been written by Allah Azza wa No one can take that from you. No one can take that from you. All you have to do is to ensure that they have a good, firm footprint and a good, firm foundation upon Al-Islam, upon the teachings of the Qur'an and upon the teachings of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, he says, safeguard his rights, as in Allah Azza wa Jal's rights. He will ever be, he will ever be with you. If you beg, then beg only Allah Azza wa Jal. As in, if you ask for something, ask Allah Azza wa Jal. There's no need to go to the creation. Ask from Allah Azza wa Jal, Rabbul Aiza, Jalla fi Ula alone. And Allah Azza wa Jal will give it to you. And he will assist you if you seek his assistance. Supplicate to Allah alone for help. And remember that if all the people gather to benefit you, they will not be able to benefit you except that which Allah had foreordained for you as in previous time. And if all of them gather to do harm to you, they will not be able to afflict you with anything other than that which Allah had predestined against you. The pens had been lifted and the ink had dried up. So here the Prophet ﷺ summarizes for us core principles, my dear brothers and sisters. These principles are not as simple as the way we heard it. It's so hard, like it, it's so hard to really implement these principles. This is a whole lifelong mission. If you've lived this in your life, you have so much to express, so much to articulate, so much to talk about, so many examples to talk about, so many problems and afflictions that you go through because of in the bid to trying to build these principles in your life. And when you have all that effort done, all that work done in the past, all that experience, you will have so much to share with your children. This is wisdom. This is what wisdom is. As you age in life, you attain wisdom. This is the, uh, the wisdom. This is the manifestation of that wisdom. But you need to have applied it in order for you to understand it. The minute, the temporary nature of this worldly life is a, is, is a, is a science of itself that takes so long to fully grasp and understand. You see, a lot of us know a lot of these things. It's like cliche. We all know this. I know this. You know this. But how many of us have truly internalized it deep down inside? That internalization requires a lot of effort and a lot of heart. And then, my dear brothers and sisters, it's important that we make a difference between mechanical ritual actions like du'as, athkar, and cognitive work, understanding the purpose and the bigger purpose of, of our lives. So there's a difference, right? There's, there's mechanical things. Like, you know, always telling a child, have you prayed? Have you, have you done your dua? Have you done your afkar? When you, when you teach it to them like this, you, you are basically making them do mechanical things. You're, you're building in them this ritualistic, this cultural kind of aspect of life, which is not always uh, beneficial in, 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 in the greater sense of things. You need to teach them the importance of all of these things. You need to teach them the cognitive aspects. The way of thinking, the world view of Al-Islam. The reason why we worship Allah Who is Allah Azza wa Jal? And all the other vices and problems that exist on the face of this earth so that they are able to protect themselves from it. When you begin to do these things, my dear brothers and sisters, you begin to move the, the system from mechanical to cognitive. From mere rituals and actions to actual understanding, depth and insight. Intu intu intuitiveness and internalization of the principles of Al-Islam. And then finally, my dear brothers and sisters, is tikrar, is repetition of these teachings. Don't feel like, I've mentioned it to you 100 times. Why aren't you doing it? No, you need to do tikrar. You need to do tikrar in action, as in you yourself need to apply these principles that you're trying to teach your children. 
You need to be that full manifestation, that example to them. So they see you. They see you going to the mosque. They see you praying. They see you doing da'wah. They see you doing good deeds. They see you. The children see you doing all of these things. They see you in the middle of the night praying to Allah Azza wa Jalla. They see you, you know, crying to Allah Azza wa Jalla. They see you in, in a difficult position sometimes. They, that you take advice from them. That you discuss with them. Consult with them. The different situations and problems in your life. Your children begin to realize that you're another human being just like them. And they begin to see the tribulations in your life. And they begin to see the struggles that you are uh, having in your life. And they also begin to appreciate and begin to learn the principles that you are applying during those difficult times. And I would say, my dear brothers and sisters, before I conclude, just a few more things. One is that in the societies that we live in, we live in a society of strangers. All of us lead individual lives. We don't have the systems and the culture that we had back home. Here, we live very individualistic lives. And so when we live individualistic lives, the core issue or challenge is one of emotion. It's not one of fight or war or uh, you know, uh, feuds that used to happen back home. Here, it's not, it's not about survival back there. Uh, it's not about survival here. It's about the emotional aspects. So it's no longer about being rigid and being you know, a very commandeering kind of force in the life of your children. It's about building emotional bonds with them. It's about becoming friends with them. It's about you know, being lo having love exchanged between yourselves and your children. This is very important, my dear ones, and I'm seeing very less of this, especially in the older generations that have immigrated to this country. So we as a newer generation, as our parents, this shift that we can make, it's about becoming a friend with your child, discussing problems with them, discussing things with them, and seeing them with a bit of respect, instead of seeing them as children. When you see them with that kind of respect, and you start to build these emotional bonds, this is when you begin to influence them. When you influence them, then you have won their hearts. You have won their hearts. You can then help them, you can then advise them, you can then teach them, you can then give them whatever it is that you want. And this is based on the advice of Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib or some other uh, righteous predecessors. It is often attributed to Ali And that is that the focus should be on emotion in this day and age, as opposed to merely information. So he says that the first seven years of their life, that you play with them. You play with them, be playful with them. It's like how Ibrahim salam was playful with his son Ismail salam. And it, it was at that playful time when Allah Azza wa ordered him to sacrifice him. What a hard test, what a difficult sacrifice in that most loving, playful age when Ismail was eight years old. The Prophet was asked to sacrifice him and he passed that test. So the first seven years you play with them. The second seven years you discipline them. You discipline them, you correct them for the action that they're doing and you teach them. And the next seven years or the rest of their life, you befriend them. You become friends with them. You become their brother, Akhi. You become their friend. It's very important, my dear brothers and sisters. You still, sometimes there's this kind of hierarchy. Sure, the child needs to respect the parent, of course, definitely. But you as a parent need to deal with them like they're your friend. A mother with a daughter like they're best friends. They do stuff together, they go to places, they influence each other. And when you do this, you build bonds, you build emotion, you build strong bonds of influence. It's not bonds, if you don't do this, the bonds are usually based on, you know, I have to stick with my parents for this certain amount of time, when I reach 18 years old, when I get my job, I'm out of here. There's so many people that we hear about that do exactly that. That which I, when I reach a certain age, when I have a certain amount of money, I am out of here. I'm out of my parents' house. This is what this is how they think. But it shouldn't be like that. It should be rather that your parents are your best friends. During your lunch hours, like at work, that you catch up for coffee. You catch up for coffee with your parents. Or you, you, you catch up with your child. Go to them. Go out of your way. Even if you have to put a bit of fuel, go to the city. Go and catch up with them. Sit with them. Have a coffee with them. These kind of bonds build exceptional influence, my dear brothers and sisters. It is very important and we need to really take advantage of that because we live lives that are very busy 
and basically it makes our children effectively orphans. With that, my dear brothers and sisters, there's a lot that can be said, and I have a lot prepared, but um, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive each and every one of us and to make us role models and examples for those who believe and those who are righteous and those who have taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to attain the science, this, this knowledge of parenting and how to do it best in this day and age towards our children and towards the community at large. Bidnillah ta'ala. Wa jazakum Allah khairan. I ask Allah Azza wa to accept from each and every one of us and to bless each and every one of you. And I uh, thank the, the uh, organizers for setting up such a beautiful event and for hosting all of us. Bidnillah ta'ala. Wa jazakum Allah khairan. Wa barakallah fikum. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.